Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lure, and I'm excited to have another great friend of mine on the line, this time from Singapore, Mr. Mauricio Barbieri. Welcome to the podcast, Mauricio. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely. And uh, this is going to be fun because we're gonna, you're going to be having to listen to two European accents here. So, uh, you know, good luck with this one. Uh, Mauricio being originally from Italy. Um, but let me introduce Mauricio and his interesting career um, over the last 20-odd years in the world of sports, digital, uh, and technology. And uh, you will find out very quickly where we'll be heading with this, and it's going to be very much a tech conversation. So uh, Mauricio kicked off his career um, actually in basketball, but we'll get to that maybe later. Uh, but in, in terms of from a technology point of view, working with MP Web, this was part of the MP Silver Group uh, as general manager, uh, launching a web platform or, or uh, you know sort of a new media platform at that time. Um, also spent a certain uh, uh, early days in uh, with the Infront Group, also again in this sort of technology and, and new media space. So this is all early 2000 kind of periods uh, where the internet really was kicking off. Uh, in our space here, especially in sports, um, spent a certain amount of time uh, with other groups. Uh, I remember your time with Live Sports in Japan as a CEO there, again, setting up a very unique business where we maybe touch on a bit later. Uh, I spent a bit of time with our good buddy Thomas Martins uh, in the Triumph uh, Media Group, again, in digital uh, and certain things which uh, Thomas was trying to do at that time. Uh, then Brock came back to, uh, to Singapore I believe in the uh, so around 2010, uh, and I think you've been pretty much there for, uh, most of the time. Uh, now uh, working in, in different roles um, in the technology. One to mention maybe was uh, the head of sports for Samsung Electronics, um, and I remember having various conversations with you at that time. Again, integrating uh, content into the phones and stuff. So hopefully we'll have a chance to touch a bit on that. Uh, and very quickly then, uh, we're jumping to your current role, which is the Head of Sports and Gaming Partnerships for Southeast Asia and Greater China in Twitter. So uh, this is going to be exciting to hear about where Twitter is, what Twitter wants to be for our industry. Um, and I know you obviously not just will be able to look at that from our region, but uh, clearly you're having global conversations there. I remember you were just recently in New York. So hopefully you can tell us and share some stories from that. But uh, before we get into all the sort of really meaty parts there, we always have a little kickoff here and uh, love to have a little warm-up story from you of how you got into the industry and uh, you know what's your passions. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for the introduction. You make me look uh, much more accomplished than I, I actually am. <laughs> Don't be modest. I like saying that I've been in sports since I was young. But that's uh, that's because um, uh, I found it was a good uh, way to, you know, a, a fun uh, fun way to to grow and interact with uh, with people. Uh, I I also found that it helped keeping my grades at uh, school uh, better than uh, than when my mother was always yelling at me, study, 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 study more. So when I realized that, that I was not a good athlete, uh, I decided I wanted to stay in sport and I turned uh, to coaching, uh, specifically basketball. So I, I basically started out as a basketball coach in uh, northern Italy, but always with this passion for uh, technology and media. Fast forward uh, for about uh, you know about ten years, uh, I started working with sub players of mine uh, around uh, how to manage data, how to analyze data, you know all this moneyball thing before it was called moneyball, mm. and uh, and then I realized that I wasn't the only one doing it. Uh, I was already looking at uh, things to do besides coaching basketball. A lucky encounter one night with a friend of mine, another former basketball coach, who said, look, Maurice, I know what you are trying to do. Let's sit down. Let's talk. Mm. And that's what brought me uh, in contact with uh, Ricardo Silva, mm -hmm. you know, founder and owner of MPN Silva. Mm -hmm. I was his first hire. And we were uh, trying to um, find a way to monetize, uh, to actually leverage this uh, digital content that started popping up, right? Yeah. Uh, we were at the time in 98, 99, where uh, in order to 
connect to the internet, you really needed to have a dial-up modem. Yep. And, uh, and, and, you know, it was only the two of us at the beginning. Uh, we had a, a service called telebasket.com that was uh, a portal of everything about basketball. Mm. Global portal um, uh, that was basically, again, crowd, crowdsourcing information before we actually call it crowdsourcing. I had uh, uh, like more than 150 contributors uh, writing short articles uh, about uh, their local leagues, uh, Greece, yeah. Turkey, Italy, United States, college basketball, professional, uh, uh, people from all over the world. And, uh, and that's, that's what uh, really started everything. We went from basketball to football, football, volleyball, volleyball, uh, winter sports. Ricardo was able to convince uh, the media partners group uh, because MP Web was the digital media arm of mm. media partners, right? Mm. We acquired by them uh, because uh, uh, media partners realized that there was uh, something to be done there. I think that uh, there was a huge enthusiasm until 2001 when the first bubble burst. Yeah. Uh, we thought that uh, everything was going to be to go much, much uh, faster than we expected. But, because Ricardo Silva is a genius, and I have no problems in saying this, mm. we, basically, we basically started doing, you know, we, we, uh, we moved from a more direct consumer offering to uh, a B2B side of things. So, so basically we were that digital service uh, a firm that was able to engage with much larger companies like telcos or other broadcasters that were looking at mm -hmm. digital content but they didn't have the infrastructure to to produce that kind of content right. and uh, and i feel like uh, it was it was a great time we we were working uh, to produce, we were the first ones to produce content for mobile phones. When uh, we are talking now about 5G, right? Uh, yeah. Old, uh, I'm old enough to remember when uh, 3G got deployed, uh, yeah. and uh, and telcos uh, all over the world they were looking for content for yeah. movie image content, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were acquiring rights. Uh, we they didn't know how to use them, uh, and um, it was uh, it was uh, really fun. I remember that uh, we were uh, we were really in a situation where every day we didn't know what was going to happen the, the day after. Mm. One night, one night was February 2001. And, and mm. I remember Ricardo calling me. It's like uh, we we need to set up a live streaming for uh, a EuroLeague uh, basketball game. It's like awesome. Uh, and then I realized that, that it was for the day after. So we had <laughs> less, less than 20 hours to set up everything in a page that was not dynamically generated. Uh, giving, uh, so we have to design it, we have to create uh, three different links for three different uh, uh, speed of streaming. Uh, mm. But it was, uh, it was exciting. It was, uh, it was something that uh, uh, really uh, made us feel uh, that uh, we were part of uh, something new, something that uh, uh, it was not the the, the usual, uh, uh, you know, nine to five job. Absolutely. Uh, I never had the problems in spending time uh, at the office. I grew that business. Uh, I, I'm not bragging. I'm just I'm just saying that yeah, I was I was given the opportunity by my leadership to, to grow this business both from a revenue standpoint, but also, you know, uh, from one person, myself, uh, up to more than 80 people creating content across all platform. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exciting times. And, and I do remember it well. Uh, I have to admit, uh, I remember we were doing similar things, obviously, but more here in Asia uh, at that time, looking at the new landscape, um, you know, at that time we still call it the internet, I guess. Um, so it wasn't really digital yet, uh, but it is now. Uh, now, I do know that, or, you know, what I mentioned earlier, you've obviously then spent a, a very interesting career, <clears throat> partially with, you know, some larger organizations and others uh, also doing certain things on your own. 
uh, maybe before we move on, uh, uh, you know, talk a little bit about some of these other companies or pick a particular one where you've had a, you know, an interesting learning there, and then we'll go into the, the next part. So you you really want me to talk about my failures now? I, no, I, not not yet. You can uh, you can talk about uh, some more victories here. That's all good. <laughs> so yes, after I left um, after I left left Singapore in two thousand and ten, then and I ended up working with Thomas uh, in Hamburg at Triumph Media Group. Uh, mm. I kind of started thinking that. Uh, it was time to um, I wanted to look at doing something uh, by myself and uh, I had this idea that um, I wanted to start leveraging social media or at least what at that time was considered to be you know social media and we are talking a very beginning of uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, uh, mm. uh, something that I looked at always at uh, an incredible uh, potential. I I was the, when I was still at um, at Media Partners at that time I was already in front Italy, so in front uh, Media Group I had already acquired Media Partners, okay. and uh, I remember I was the first one to do a deal with YouTube at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being yelled at by, by my bosses. Uh, <laughs> they are like, oh, oh, you are giving away content for free. These yep. people should pay for it. Uh, this is uh, unacceptable and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I always thought that after, when, when, uh, when uh, social media started becoming a thing and in 2010 they they started moving up right yep. i thought that uh, i don't want to find my audience um, per se mm. uh, i don't want to create a channel and bring people to this channel i i want to leverage the fact that these people are already spending a lot of time on social media and uh, i want to to create content that lives there uh, Mm -hmm. And trying to find uh, revenue opportunity, uh, you know, monetization opportunity. So, I um, I kind of left uh, TMG and and decided, okay, I'll try to leverage my my experience, my uh, my network, my ideas, and I want to to put something together. And uh, with um, with another partner of mine, uh, with. Uh, you know, we put down a little bit of money and we started uh, looking at what to create. Mm. Uh, was the first, uh, uh, was an attempt to create branded content uh, that could live on social media. Now, we're talking about 10 years ago, right? And now this yeah. is something that uh, everybody does uh, on their own uh, through other companies, whatever. It's not important. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, it was. Uh, the right idea, but at the wrong time. I'm not mm. trying to take credit for anything. I, it's, <laughs> I, I felt like uh, I couldn't uh, just defy certain kind of investment considering uh, the level of penetration of social media at that time. Mm. Now it's uh, now it's much easier, right? But now, yeah, now you know that you can make a million dollars from YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook if you do certain things. Yeah. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, not, not just yet. Yeah. And then uh, at the same time, uh, I was trying to leverage um, still my passion around, uh, I wanted to work around uh, uh, data and sport, mm. this time around, uh, around football. And that's where uh, I worked uh, with um, another team in Italy and we founded Goal Shouter, which is it's still going on. It's still going. It's not okay. like they shut it down. It's it's not uh, as big as I would have liked, uh, but uh, you know, it's still uh, a small company that uh, make revenue, and uh, it is a crowdsourced platform to collect football data. Uh, this uh, this is the idea that uh, not everyone has uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to pay for data. Mm. Uh, but we wanted to give uh, a cheap and reliable solution to all football clubs in the world, all football players in the world, 
to collect data, share them, uh, make them available to whomever might, uh, might need it, uh, and trying to make uh, football a little bit more democratic or football data a little bit more democratic. Yeah, oh, great. I mean, and this is all really helpful, I think, for everyone who's listening in to really understand your background and how you've been moving around and on the back of, of course, had, you know, massive learning uh, in this space from the early days of the Internet to, you know, now, you know, we're already in the uh, Facebook or, or in the, in the uh, social media space, which we're going to obviously touch on a lot more uh, coming here. But before we jump into the into the Twitter world, let's call it, um, let's, I want to talk a little bit about your learning and, and, and some of your experiences with, uh, with Samsung. You know, again, a huge company. Um, and I do remember you were working again very much sort of on the integration, I believe, content um, and the experiences on a, on a mobile device. And of course, the mobile device is the all to device now for everything in many, in many ways. So share a little bit about what you saw there, uh, what was already happening. So again, this is a few years back when you were with them, but you spent several years with them. And so I'm sure there's some interesting uh, ideas from that is still there. Yes, uh, it was definitely an interesting time. For, uh, for a series of reasons. So Samsung at the time, I joined Samsung uh, in January 2013. Uh, I was a little bit torn at the beginning. I had put so much time and effort into Go Shouter that I felt like uh, I was um, letting my partners down. Uh, I was letting this idea die. Mm. On the other hand, though, there was this, uh, this idea of joining a company that in 2013 was at the Apex, it was uh, really the number one consumer electronics company in the world. It still is. Uh, yep. When it came to mobile phones, uh, these guys went from zero to be number one basically overnight. I mean, mm. through hard work, uh, these guys uh, poured a lot of resources into it and so on and so forth. But they reached a point where they, they are like, uh, we want to go head-to-head against Apple in the world of content and services. Mm. And, uh, they set up uh, these uh, teams all over the world, United States, Latin America, Europe, and of course, also Asia, yep. uh, uh, where a uh, uh, bunch of talented individuals were being asked to create, uh, to come up with ideas, concepts, and create products around these ideas so that uh, uh, we wanted to give uh, a reason uh, to a possible customer to buy a Samsung phone rather than another Android phone oh. or to buy a Samsung phone rather than a, a, an Apple device. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to, to get, uh, uh, yeah, we wanted to create our own version of uh, you know, the App Store and, uh, and, mm. uh, and, apps and so on and so forth. Now, my job interview was, uh, what would you do? I told them, uh, they came back with a couple of comments and I'm like, uh, well, it's not what I would do, but uh, I mean, th that's your choice. And then it's like, okay, okay, do what you have. To do. And, uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and it was, uh, it was uh, shocking for me also because the Samsung is a massive, massive corporation. I even though I work for big sports agencies, the scale of the process alone, uh, you know, whether it's HR, whether it's finance, whether it's reporting uh, the expenses, uh, mm. you know. Yeah, that's a different kettle of fish, I'm sure. We, we were a team of about 25, 30 people, and we come up, uh, I feel like we came up with some interesting ideas. Uh, some worked, some didn't. Uh, can, we, can we give some actual examples of you know a couple of things which you did, um, which you again maybe you said worked and maybe one or two which which you didn't. Look, I, I, I will speak about what I did. I, I cannot. Sure. I don't sure. want to talk about uh, you know my colleagues who work over there. But uh, I was tasked to actually build the product around sport, and not just uh, you know finding content, but actually build the, the actual app. Mm -hmm mobile app, a version for mobile, a version for tablet, a version for VR, a version for um, smart um, watches, a version for uh, smart TVs. Um, so it was, uh, it was uh, you know, not that I didn't know how to do it, but it was, uh, it was fascinating how to put all these things together. Mm. 
I, I feel like uh, we we did extremely well uh, up until uh, basically the company decided to shift uh, uh, focus uh, and uh, you know go back and say okay this content business probably is not what we are good at. All right. Focus on building uh, amazing phones, amazing amazing devices. Uh, um, I think that uh, Samsung had uh, an amazing opportunity, especially in the VR. I think that at that time uh, if they had decided to secure that vertical, it would have been a massive shift. Now VR has gone back to a possible mainstream use to uh, more of a niche, educational, whether it's a sport, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, medical field and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that the, it's not like it didn't work. It's just that uh, when the company decides to, to go a different direction, uh, then uh, whatever you've done uh, might not have uh, a long-lasting effect. Everything shuts down, everything focuses, everybody you know, either moves on or moves forward within the company. I decided to move on to another couple of uh, more or less successful experiences and ended up at Twitter and don't regret it at all. Yeah. And we'll get into Twitter in a, in a minute. I had last one more, because you've been really so focused your, your last 20 years on, on the in the online space. And of course, you know, with that sort of couple of years there in the with a, working with a mobile operator, I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you where you see mobile and online consumption for right from a rights holder point of view you know having worked for agencies where it's all about obviously how you monetize and how you bring new revenue streams to um, to ip owners where do you see this and uh, not from a twitter point of view but from you know just your other background where do you see the shift is and and with ott and all this stuff going on what, what's your thought on that well, I, I remember having, uh, you know, very heated this conversation with my colleagues from a more traditional media background, uh, like 10 years, 15 years ago, when I said, look, guys, you, you're saying that uh, people are going to watch uh, a live game on TV. I'm just saying that that live game might be somewhere else mm. or it might be distributed uh, uh, through a different uh, uh, protocol right uh, so i felt like uh, i feel that now probably this confusion finally is not there anymore mm. i think that now content lives uh, wherever you want to put it uh, yep. i think that sometimes uh, rights owners uh, let me let me preface this this industry is extremely risk averse because there's so much money at stake you mm -hmm. don't want to lose uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, on the wrong decision. Yep. But now, uh, the wrong decision is whether you are willing to accept the fact that, that the world has changed or not. Uh, if you work in a sports agency or if you are a rights owner and uh, having a, a, you know, an old school traditional approach where, oh, let me sell all my broadcast rights and then let me go and look at digital and then within digital let me check uh, social media and so on and so forth uh, this is going to be bad for you mm -hmm. uh, if you are a owner you want to look at how do I get my content into the hands and in front of the face of as many people as possible and unlike 15 years ago where uh, when you might have had these digital opportunities, but they might have been more expensive uh, or uh, a little more difficult to, to manage. Now it's just a matter of knowing what, what you're doing. Uh, you know that you can put something on a satellite and somebody will uh, pick it up. But if you are not prepared to the fact that your content for which you might have collected a license fee three years previous cycle, now, all of a sudden, people are a little bit more wary to give you money up front. They want to have better ROI on that investment and so on and so forth. Yeah. I feel like you are going to be, you know, history. I think that uh, anyone that uh, is working, if you own an IP, your, uh, your first question should be, okay, how do I get it out there? Regardless whether I find money from broadcasters or digital platforms or a telco or whatnot, you want to be prepared that that, that content needs to be uh, distributed. 
And not only that, you need to have an internal strategy that allows you to be very clear on how you make your money back. Yep. The time of just of relying only on license fees is done. Yeah. Even uh, uh, you need to be able to actually work with your licensees uh, to make sure that they are happy and they recoup the investment. Otherwise, the three years down the road, they are going to go away, especially the ones that have spent money for the first time on, uh, on content, like uh, AIS in Thailand for the Olympic Games or uh, true both, uh, both, uh, both the rights of the English Premier League uh, outright because they're like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to, to take care of that uh, myself uh, and I, I want to make sure that uh, I get all the money back and so on and so forth. Uh, even the broadcasters themselves, they are looking now at uh, other ways to monetize the content. Five years ago, no, no, I'm not putting anything on digital because otherwise I'm cannibalizing my offer. No. Yeah, now you have no choice. <laughs> yeah, and, and I do totally agree, I think, with some of the comments you're making here, and we've had covered that with some of the other uh, interviews before, um, that there currently is definitely a certain uh, destruction and, and disruption, of course, uh, in our space going on, and the monetization, which is really always the ultimate trick. The delivery is a technology play, and, and that's fun and, and interesting, but uh, at the end of the day, what everyone from a rights holder point of view, or if maybe you're an agency as well, you always worry about or concerned about is then how do you monetize it? You know, that I can deliver it now on so many levels in so many ways, that's fantastic. But unfortunately, the leakage and or in some degrees then the monetization is no longer quite the same anymore, right? So, and that's I'm sure what you've seen as well, right? Working in all those different platforms. Uh, that's the hard part. Uh, I don't think anyone's quite cracked it yet and, and uh, I don't want to go too deep into it, but uh, you got any last thought on that? Uh, um, you know, where do you see that heading? I think that uh, one way or another, rights owners uh, will have uh, will face pressure from uh, existing partners that are uh, unsatisfied with uh, with what they are getting in return. Uh, a broadcaster, a pay TV broadcaster, will see diminishing return on the investment on property X rather than property Z. Mm. So they will uh, try to negotiate the price. Uh, Unless it's a new broadcaster, they want to enter the market, so they are willing to pay premium and so on and so forth. We saw this happening in more mature market when BT bought the rights for English Premier League six years ago. It's going to happen. It happened the same thing in Indonesia and Thailand with English Premier League, this, uh, this cycle of rights. Yeah. The thing, though, is uh, entities like the zone, telcos buying rights, uh, social media uh, or OTT players uh, looking to distribute content uh, in a non-traditional way are here to stay. If I am uh, a rights owner, I want to deal with them, but not simply because they are a, a new series of wallets that I can uh, get money from, because they can help me stay relevant. Right. F1, uh, they had to launch a direct-to-consumer service. Uh, they had to make sure that that sport uh, was uh, relevant uh, to a younger generation, to a generation right. of people that don't have the money to pay mm -hmm. for the sports package. But they might be willing to invest time or a little bit of money for to access that content on a digital platform. This, this, this is done. I think that there will be a consolidation of players, though. It's mm -hmm. going to be difficult for a new player to come uh, onto the stage. Look what happened last year with FMA in, in, uh, in Indonesia. Spent yeah. a lot of money for big properties. I don't want to comment on why it didn't work and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, they tried and it didn't work out. Yeah. And those rights were picked up by the existing broadcaster, by you know old uh, school uh, players uh, that now have faced the same uh, the same situation. We paid for these rights. Are we sure that we are doing the math uh, by just broadcasting the games on TV? Is it the right thing to do right now? Let us look at different ways to monetize this content, if only to make sure that that content is relevant and in front of those guys that 10 years from now will have a family, will have money to spend, uh, 
to buy our products. Absolutely. And that's an interesting way to, to segment now into the world of Twitter. Because at the end of the day, there is, uh, you know, content is, is on Twitter as well, but it's obviously in a different form. A lot of it is short form. Start, let's, tell me a bit about, uh, you know, how do you see Twitter playing a role um, in the world of sports and, and, you know, your role as well, you know, how you enable it and how you're working with, with content owners? I'm not saying this because I work for, um, uh, I work for the company or um, because I'm contractually obligated to say this. Uh, I've been a fan of Twitter from the very beginning. I always thought that this was the perfect example of how to connect with people that you don't know. Twitter is not a social network. Twitter is a social media platform. You download uh, Twitter from the news section of the App Store or uh, Google Play, right? Uh, mm. So it's, uh, it's a way for you to know what's happening in the world. Yeah. And probably the common denominator uh, when it comes to conversation among strangers uh, is sport. Everywhere you go, the easiest way to, to, to strike a conversation is like, uh, oh, are you a football fan? Are you a basketball fan? Are you a baseball fan? Uh, oh, those Yankees, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the easiest way to, to start talking to strangers. And we noticed that when something in the world of sport uh, is happening, Twitter is the platform where uh, people start talking about. Right. I like to, to say that uh, Twitter is the largest, largest sports venue in the world at any given time. Mm -hmm. Imagine yeah. you are really very much like when you go to a stadium, to a, to a sports venue, and you might be seated next to a perfect stranger. Right? Twitter is exactly like that, right? Mm -hmm. You start talking about something, maybe the conversation is interesting enough to be picked by people that have the same interests, they might not uh, agree with you, and that's yeah. a story, of course. Uh, but the, the idea is uh, something is happening right now, not yesterday. Twitter is what is happening right now. Other platforms are what happened last night. Uh, yeah. So. If you're saying something interesting, maybe you pick up, uh, you start a conversation, and then you move on. The game ends, uh, you start talking about something else. You start focusing on something else. My job within the company in, uh, in my region uh, is to, I act as, uh, uh, I, I try to evangelize the product to, to those partners that, uh, to those publishers that maybe are not using it or they are not using it to the full potential of, uh, of the platform, um, try to figure out how to better connect with their audience, uh, whether it's an organic play, whether it's a paid play, whether it's a marketing activity. And uh, once they are at a certain level, why not talking also about uh, monetizing this content, mm. uh, which is something that people have no idea that we do. And we do very well. Okay. We were the first ones to, to you know, uh, people always says that, oh, you guys bought the rights for uh, NFL uh, three years ago and so on and so forth. And I'm like, there was more of a commercial agreement where we knew that the volume of conversation around the NFL on Twitter was so big uh, that we were like, hey, guys, if you do certain guys, meaning uh, the NFL, <laughs> things we are willing to monetize that content of course there might be an MG and whatnot uh, people were uh, screaming oh these guys are giving uh, 1 million per game 10 million dollars was that uh, was that deal uh, for 10 games the Thursday night package which is notoriously not even that great of a deal uh, right. the game is free to air on NBC is available on NFL.com is available also on NFL Network but People forget that Yahoo, the year before, had paid, uh, I think, $20 million for only one game. Uh, it was one of the long, one of the games that, that the NFL had played in, uh, in London. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that bad. So we actually proved the fact that uh, if we do certain things, everybody's at Our users, the NFL, the brands that are associated to that content. So why not? Of course, you need to strike uh, a balance, right? Uh, we are not in the business of uh, acquiring rights. We are not in the business of uh, acquiring subscribers. The year after, Amazon bought those rights for way more money than what we were willing to invest. Uh, 
But because they wanted to package that with Amazon Prime, like they did last year, actually, yeah, last year, yeah. last December, with the 20 games that they had with English Premier League. Correct. And, and everybody immediately subscribed to Amazon Prime, right? Uh, because let me watch these 20 games. They are very good. They are the December games. And notoriously, those games are good. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we had an interesting. I had an interesting chat with um, with a couple of people on that. Uh, uh, let me let's uh, quickly sort of move you a little bit. Into you know, I just wanted to touch on a few points here. Now, on the you know again, your conversations um, you know as head of sports and gaming uh, is it mostly with rights holders um, to say, look, what can we do for you here? So whether it's the Premier Leagues of the world or the NBA's, uh, or is it more even with, with local leagues? Uh, where do you spend most of your time? Just curious to see uh, how that works. My, my job uh, is mostly talking with local entities that might have a global content, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So it could be Stadio Mastro. Uh, I remember that I said that during a, during a conference, a CK Lee is their uh, chief sports content, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, I remember that we were sharing the stage. I said, when I said with Twitter, that was the first call uh, that I made. And, I, and, and it was true. I, I want to work with local publishers uh, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to find ways uh, for them to be happy with using Twitter. Whether they make money, whether they have better reach, whether they get better return on their own investment, maybe they can use Twitter to drive more subscriptions, to, to get more money from their own sponsors, and so on and so forth. We can work together. But I do work with some global, global entities, or at least the local offices of the global entities like the NBA, for example. Yeah. Can you talk about that? I remember you were recently in New York, uh, but you were, I wasn't sure whether you uh, this is already public uh, for public use or not. Yeah, yeah we can because uh, yeah. we, starting uh, starting this season, we started streaming uh, between two and three games per week mm -hmm. on in the Philippines uh, through the local NBA Twitter handle NBA okay. score Philippines. All right, and uh, that was. Uh, of course, we have an incredible relationship with the NBA in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. The NBA without Twitter, uh, I'm not saying that uh, without Twitter wouldn't be the NBA. I'm just saying that Twitter is the perfect example of uh, so many games every night. Uh, people are uh, watching the games, uh, using their phones. Between uh, Tinder, Snap, uh, and something else, uh, every once in a while they go on Twitter and say, hey, <laughs> and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so much so that we actually have uh, hashtag NBA Twitter. It's a thing. The players themselves, uh, they know that uh, using Twitter is good for them to stay in touch with mm. their fans, right? Uh, so we have this amazing relationship with the NBA. We have this amazing relationship also with NBA Asia. Mm -hmm. Always monetize their content. We are always able to find the sponsors for them here in Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, uh, I would say, we started talking last August, beginning of September. We knew that they were struggling uh, to find, uh, uh, you know, a more conventional distributor for their games. Uh, okay. uh, their traditional partners were not willing to pay what they were uh, looking for. They yeah. were looking for and so on and so forth. I do not want to pass judgment in this, but uh, we started talking and we say, guys, we would be happy to support you. Uh, we had just done something during the draft uh, in Japan uh, because of their Japanese player picked with uh, by the Washington. Uh, Washington. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've always done something for them when they have players coming over and so on and so forth. So we started talking and say, why don't we put one, two, three games on Twitter? Of course, I I always ask for more, right? And then uh, and then I get a half. Huh? <laughs> and then uh, lo and behold, uh, we we managed to get uh, this deal done where where uh, for the opening week uh, we had one game per day. Right. It was great. Uh, we we really provided uh, good reach for them. And after the opening week, until uh, until now, we, we are doing two or three games per week. Uh, we hopefully be able to continue this coverage also during the playoffs. So let's see what happens. 
Good to see. So what happens if your local broadcasters don't, your conventional broadcasters, your usual partners don't want to deal with you anymore? Where do you go? It's not like they don't have, uh, you know, Game Pass any longer in the Philippines, which uh, which is their OTT offer. Yeah. Uh, but how do you, you know, supplement, uh, you know, fill the void that was uh, created by the fact that you are not free to air any longer? Mm. And, uh, and of course, it's not uh, it's not exclusive with us. They are also doing it with Facebook. Okay. Uh, Let's put the two things together. They are getting lots of views and lots of in- engagement. We, we are happy to partner with them. And in the meantime, we we'll try to find more sponsors and more monetization opportunities for them. A couple of quick questions here coming out of what you just said. Two, one is, um, how do you geoblock on Twitter? Because I know that's definitely an issue Facebook's been facing. Um, you can geoblock, so I couldn't access it not being in the Philippines, or how does it work? That's a very good question, because historically, Twitter is open to everyone. Yeah. You cannot geoblock a tweet. If you say something, is for worldwide that's, consumption. That's it, yeah. But that doesn't mean that uh, you cannot geoblock the actual media asset, right? Mm, okay. So... Uh, the experience is not that great, but um, meaning that uh, uh, unlike other platforms where your, that content doesn't even show up on your timeline uh, because you can really select the fact that that post is going to be made available only in certain territories. Okay. Plus, the tweet will be made available globally, but uh, like in many other situations, uh, you will receive a message that says this content is not available in your in your territory, and that's it. This right. is this is something that we are. Uh, I mean, if you spend two hours on the internet every day, I'm pretty sure that two or three videos that you try to click on, uh, they will come up with that uh, with Correct. that Correct. with that. Message. And where exactly? I have to admit, I'm, I I use Twitter, but I'm not necessarily for live content. Where do I actually find it? I mean, is there a particular button, or is it I have to find that that tweet to to uh, to click on, or how do I find the match? Uh, let's say if I will be in the Philippines. Uh, the way we frame it is that uh, the content is not for Twitter. The content is for you to use on your own handle on Twitter, right? Ah, uh, right. Okay. So. Uh, in the case of the NBA Philippines, if you were to follow the NBA, mm-hmm. you would actually see the live game uh, on the top of your timeline. Right, got it. Right on top. Every time that there's something live uh, coming from one of the uh, handles that you follow, mm. it to be there. Okay. okay. But uh, if you want to make sure that you don't miss anything... Uh, of course, the, the, the content, if you don't follow it, uh, you know, the content might be surface to you because we know that you like the NBA and uh, we will try to make you find it uh, organically. Uh, and that's why we work so well with brands because the brands are helping uh, the distribution of this content. We, we use the brand's money to promote the content, to push the content to their target audience. So the best way not to say anything is when you follow an account, uh, just remember to select your notifications and put them on. So every time that there's a tweet or every time that there's a live associated with that tweet, you are notified and you, you go there and watch the game. Right, very interesting. And what I, the other thing I wanted to say, and this is more for our listeners from around the world who aren't as familiar with f- sports here in the region, uh, the Philippines is a basketball country. Basketball is the number one sport. Um, the Philippines are mad about it. So this isn't some niche market where the NBA is trying something. This is a very significant market uh, for basketball and, of course, for the NBA. And I'm sure over the years I've made a lot of money there. So to go now with a you know less traditional broad broadcast uh, option uh, and working with you guys again that shows um, how the NBA is uh, constantly innovating and, and always looking at the the next level right so I think it's very that's really an interesting one yeah look let's not forget that the moment that they sign a deal with a broadcaster uh, probably this relationship will be adjusted of course right, right? a broadcaster might not be interested in having especially if he if it is a 
a TV broadcaster or if they have other kind of whatever interest, whatever play uh, they have. Uh, they might not be interested in sharing the same uh, live stream with us. Yeah. That's not a problem. Uh, maybe we work with broadcasters to find a way so that uh, whatever they don't use, they can use it on their own handle and uh, getting bigger reach, bigger engagement, and maybe even uh, even revenue. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Um, just being, uh, being uh, careful with our timing a bit here as well. Um, let me move you a little bit into sort of one of the, the second or third piece of uh, what we always talk about. And uh, I think we've had some great stories already on, on things which worked. Um, but I want to dig a little bit more into uh, the learning, the, the sort of the hard lessons um, in some of the things you've done uh, over the years, uh, Mauricio, you know, what would be the one you would, you know, if you're a young entrepreneur or someone, you know, just starting off their career, uh, you know, what is a lesson of your 20 years uh, you would want to share with them? Yeah, the lesson, the main lesson is not to bust anybody's balls. Um, <laughs> okay. And not try to convince them that you are right uh, uh, at all costs. Uh, this is more of a general attitude thing. Uh, I feel like I'm a little bit better than 20 years ago. Not 100% better, but uh, if only because I'm older and I don't, I don't and have. Wiser. <laughs> I don't have the same level of energy that I used to have. I think that uh, uh, now it seems like I, I'm a, a little bit of a d bag uh, in in saying this, but uh, I've always uh, I, I think that right now. I'm living in the world that I was envisioning uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, OTT deliver, dig delivery, digital uh, brands, uh, uh, sponsoring a certain content depending on uh, where you're at, uh, when, the time, when the time is right, and so on and so forth. Uh, social media, of course. Uh, I think that when I try to do, let's say, when I try to build a direct-to-consumer uh, product, like uh, in Italy, last year that I was, uh, I was in Italy, we had these uh, two, three projects, totally direct to consumer. One was uh, totally ad supported, uh, and it was only about winter sports. Mm -hmm. The other one, two, were uh, a pay project, and uh, they were modeled on the MLB.com uh, example. Mm -hmm. So launched uh, with the Ricardo Silva, we launched uh, Serie A.tv and Euroleague.net. Uh, so these two things were uh, were meant to address, uh, you know, certain inefficiencies. Ricardo at that time uh, hadn't been able to sell the rights uh, in North America. Uh, Euroleague.net, uh, Euroleague basketball, uh, you know, they were making good money from broadcasters, but. Uh, a lot of those games are not watched. Mm. I felt like uh, we were going to be more successful. Uh, same, same thing happened with Live Sports Japan. Uh, we wanted to to be what the zone is now, but probably we didn't have the patience to to stick around uh, and say, no, this is what is going to happen. This right. is. Uh, uh, or, or at least, let's put it this way. Yeah. My so boss, timing, timing is critical, right? I think is is sort of where you're heading here a bit, right? Correct. My bosses weren't patient enough. Uh, right. Neither with me nor uh, with the with the project. But uh, but it, it was um, uh, again. I feel like uh, now it's happening. Uh, I don't have regrets. I I did uh, what I felt was right. Uh, mm -hmm. I learned a lot. Uh, um, Every choice I made at the end of the day led me to this conversation that we are having. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I work for one of the best companies in the world in terms of culture, in terms of how they treat people, in terms of how they treat uh, the users, not only the people that work for them, but also we do care about our, our users, whether right. they are my publishers or the actual end user. We, do really care if if you spent some time with uh, with the people that work at Twitter, you would you would be surprised. They, they are like, how did you end up there? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to ask. Maybe they made a mistake. Don't 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 tell them that. 
Right. Oh, that's but it's and that's interesting. And and the story about timing, I I, I would have dozens of stories of uh, getting timing wrong in, in my career here. You know what I've done for 25 years. Um, so yes, timing I think is always it. Or having of course the the runway to see it through. And you know we'll all know in a few years whether the zone will get there. Right. I think what they're doing is brilliant, uh, and we all can see that it is the future. But it is it will take a lot of money to get there. And uh, let's hope they're they're I'll keep finding that. So, now, the last one here to, to wrap it up. Marcus, sorry. Just, sorry, go ahead. I don't want to be confrontational here. But <laughs> to your point here, I think that the zone is already here. Look at what happened. Uh, sure, sure, true. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, they're here. ESPN, ESPN, two years ago, three years ago, they were like, no, yeah, yeah. Now, ESPN Plus. They know, they know that this is the future. Now, no one will have all the content. But instead of having 10, 15 different players, probably everything will consolidate because you need a lot of money to sustain yep. this business. You will have a bunch of uh, players that will have the content that you want uh, and they can coexist. And if the content is not there, with all due respect, uh, probably is not worth the, a license fee. And therefore, you have to, you as a right owner, you have to make it available to your audience if you think that there's an audience for that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and there are obviously multiple ways. Now, one of our clients and, and um, we've been involved in for many years is Glory, our Glory Kickboxing. And we're on Snapchat and, and we're making money on Snapchat, which is, uh, you know, something I've never thought of, I guess, before. But, uh, you know, I think those all those new media platforms or social media platforms, whatever one would call them, um, they have a reason for existence. Um, there are ways to monetize it, and I think that's the key point here. You know, Twitter is part of that as well, of course. Um, and then you know, more and more opportunities will come up there. Um, so, Mauricio, you know, your title is head of sports and gaming partnerships. Uh, can we talk a bit about what the gaming part of it um, and uh, the exciting things you guys do in the in esports or e-gaming, which I guess has you know similar. Uh, opportunities as the the call it real world of sports. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's a good question, fair question. Uh, uh, very very much similar to what happens uh, uh, with more traditional uh, properties. Now there's interest around uh, the competitive side of gaming. Uh, gaming has been around since since the very beginning. The, yeah. the thing is that. Uh, you had to travel to, to do a, a, a tournament and so on and so forth. Now, thanks to the internet, you can play against somebody else, uh, even though you are in Singapore, yeah. somebody else is somewhere else. Of course, the big events are still played in one single place, in a big arena with a lot of people, excitement, exactly like uh, the, the FIFA World Cup final. There's, yeah. uh, there's interest in seeing the best uh, best players in the world doing uh, what they are doing. The thing is, uh, Twitter is a great platform exactly for, for these kind of uh, things, for gamers, uh, publishers, uh, teams, uh, organizations uh, that want to have uh, more reach, they want to have more engagement, they want to generate more, uh, more revenue. Yeah. My job is to explain to them how to use the platform uh, in the best way possible, try to find uh, new ways uh, to, to engage with their sponsors or maybe find the new sponsors. Uh, looking at, um, you know, it's, it's not the Twitch or Mixer or Nemo. It's a combination of everything. Mm -hmm. Exactly like we, we said earlier, if you are a publisher, if you, are, if you own IP, uh, the more uh, the more platforms you use, uh, the higher chances that your content becomes valuable, and therefore you can uh, you can be successful. Same thing here. I I am very happy that uh, you know when I started uh, the gaming thing was uh, just uh, a small part of my mandate. Uh, but uh, in in within the first uh, three four months, I had already. Uh, work with a couple of entities in Singapore, Indonesia, and Thailand. Now it's probably it's it's a good chunk of my time working with the local uh, partners, gaming partners, to find ways uh, to make them grow. I just onboarded uh, a very famous uh, Singaporean uh, gamer, mm -hmm. uh, Sian Razor, 
great guy, amazing, uh, amazing character, uh, really, uh, really, really nice person. And I hope that it will be the first of many. That there are so many opportunities for, uh, for uh, gaming. Um, for whoever, uh, whoever operates in gaming and esports, uh, there are plenty of opportunities that can be explored. Yeah, no doubt. And, and I think we could probably spend a whole hour just talking about the gaming world on its, on its own, which is huge here in Southeast Asia, especially on mobile. So it's easy to see how uh, a platform like Twitter becomes you know, a big part of it. Um, but uh, we don't have the time here, unfortunately, today. Uh, we're almost here for an hour. Uh, it was great talking to you, Mauricio. Thank you again, thank you again for your time uh, and sharing all that wisdom with you giving us a good insight into the world of Twitter and how you're working with some uh, with, with platform owners or content owners. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again very soon. Marcus, thank you for having me. And uh, thanks uh, to anyone that uh, will be listening to this. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Uh, we'll definitely see each other uh, uh, around this soon. Definitely. Ciao, Mauricio. Ciao. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.